discern them? How do you discern false teachings? How do you discern false teachers? That is the topic of conversation for this evening here. And I want to welcome you to the Thursday night Bible study with Clarence Haynes. And on behalf of my wife and everyone here at the Bible study club, we thank you for, for tuning in and joining with us this week. Um, for those of you brand new, we would just like you to, if you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, if it's YouTube, just like and subscribe to our channel. If you are on Facebook, make sure you like and follow our page. This way you will uh, keep up to date with everything that is going on in the Bible Study Club. Uh, saying hello to Jamie. I see Jamie just popped in there and to everyone else joining. If this is your first time, we like to do three things in the Bible Study Club. Um, the first thing is to get you or to encourage you to open God's word. The second thing is to um, get you to discover truth in God's word. That's what we try to help you do here. And then third and finally is to have you apply it to your life. Because if you don't apply the truth, then you're basically just kind of wasting your time. So that's where all the transformation happens when you apply the truth to your life. Um I, uh, we are currently in the middle of our series on discernment. And so uh, this would be week number three of our series on discernment. If you missed any of the previous two sessions, you can just go back and watch them and then you'll be all caught up um, once we do that. So I don't have a whole lot of announcements or anything like that. So I'm going to dive right into God's word tonight. We got a lot of ground to cover. And hopefully we'll see if we get through it all tonight. If we do, fantastic. If we don't, I have no problem uh, uh, adjusting. And I see Mark Sawicki out there. Hello, Mark and Paula and Adrian and Sherry, uh, Aaron. Uh, thank you all for, for, for joining us here uh, tonight. All right, so let's pray and let's jump right into God's word. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I ask that you would just help us to really gather and, and understand uh, how to discern truth, because that's really what it's all about. And I give you all the praise and the glory and honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's dive right in. The, the, the title of our session this week is How to Discern False Teaching and False Teachers. Now, we, we're going through our uh, discernment series, and I just want to do very quickly a, a reminder of what discernment is. Discernment is the ability to perceive well or judge well, or as Spurgeon said, it's knowing the difference, not, know, not just, but not know, I'm sorry, let me read it right, not knowing the difference between right and wrong, but knowing the difference between right and almost right. And that is going to be very, very important for what we're going to talk about um, in our session. Remember, we are discerning your four things you need to discern in your life. You need to discern the voice of God, the move of God, the word of God, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight, teaching and preaching, and also you're discerning the will of God. Now, before we dive into that, I want to bring up something which I haven't talked about yet in this series. And that is that discernment is also a spiritual gift. We've been primarily focusing on, um, you know, kind of more practical aspects of it, of how do we use the word of God to help us discern truth, right? But discernment is also a spiritual gift. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're not going to turn there, but you can go ahead and read it. Um, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says that he gives us the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or not. So discernment is not just based on the Word of God, even though that's your foundation. Discernment is also a spiritual gift. So sometimes the discernment that will come from the Holy Spirit, even if you're not fully aware of everything that's in the word of God. So what that means is sometimes God will give you discernment where you, you're not sure what's wrong, but you recognize that something is wrong or something is off. That is discernment coming from the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. 
you know, we, we, we talked, remember last week about the move of the Holy Spirit. And in Hebrews 13, 9, it says, you know, do not be attracted by strange new ideas. That's what we talked about last week. Well, about 20 years ago, maybe more than that, I, I, uh, I have my, my years may be off a little bit, but a little bit more than 20 years ago, there was this fresh, I'm putting in air quotes here, new move of the Holy Spirit that was kind of, for lack of a better word, sweeping the nation or sweeping the globe. And so curious me, uh, decided to go check out and investigate this quote unquote move, this fresh new idea or move of the Holy Spirit. And so we decided to go see um, this pastor who was preaching and, and, and propagating this new move of the Holy Spirit. And so when I went to this church that was hosting this gentleman, I walked in and the moment that I walked into that place, I sensed and I recognized and I knew, I said, there is something not right about what is going on here. I could sense that there was a spirit in that place, but what I also could sense is that it wasn't the Holy Spirit. In other words, my, my spiritual antennas just shot up saying like something is off here, something is wrong here, not sure exactly what it is. God has given you, remember this, the Holy Spirit. So he allows you sometimes to discern when His when it's his presence and when it's not. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but there have been times where I have walked into church and into a building and immediately I could sense that the presence of God was there. If that's ever happened to you, just let me know. Just give me an amen or yes, I can understand that. And you walk in and you sense that God's presence is here. That's a sign of discernment that you recognize the presence of God. Because think about it, your spirit is connecting. You have the spirit of God in you. So where God's spirit is present, there's going to be that instant uh, agreement and connection. And you're going to know in your heart that, wait a second, I'm walking in and I sense the spirit of God. It's almost like your spirit leaps within you. And I've sensed that before. And so God gives you spiritually the ability to discern what is going on sometimes, even if you're not as seasoned in the word of God, you can still discern what is going on because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And so I didn't bring that point out before, but I wanted to make that point um, because you might feel like, well, I don't, I'm not two seasons in the word. So that means I won't have enough discernment. That's not necessarily true. The spirit of God lives in you so he can help you understand whether something is of God or not. Now, let's move forward because tonight we are talking about discerning false teachers and false teachings. Now, the first question you probably would ask Clarence is why do we need to do this? Well, here's why we need to do this. The reason why is because false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, false apostles, sorry, false teachings are not new to the church. They have been happening in the church since the beginning of the church, go all the way back to, to the book of Acts. And guess what? They're going to continue to happen until Jesus comes again. So we need to be aware of what is going on. Let me give you some scriptures that talk about this. If you look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 and 16, it says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And notice verse 16, this is very important. By their fruit, you will recognize them. The reason why I point that out, and we're going to look at this more later, is that Jesus says the way you recognize a false prophet, or one of the ways, is not necessarily just by what they say, but look at their character and who they are. And that can help you identify what a false prophet is. But Jesus said, watch out. So we got to watch out because they're out there. Go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, and it says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay, that's 1 John 
chapter 4, verse 1. And then 2 Peter, chapter 2. This is where we're going to spend a lot of time tonight, the bulk of our time, actually. But verse 1 says, But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. So here is what Peter is saying. There will be false teachers among you. There were false prophets among Israel. There were false prophets and teachers in the early church. There will be false prophets and teachers among you. So Jesus warned about this. Paul warned about this. John warned about this. Peter warned about this. So we need to pay attention because this is a reality of what happens in the church. And by the way, by false prophets and teachers, I'm not talking about cults. I want you to get this. I am talking about teachings coming from pulpits in our churches of people who profess to be Christians. So I'm not talking about cults here. We're talking specifically about false prophets and teachings in the church from people that profess to be Christians. Because Paul and Jesus and Peter said, they will be among you. Now, here's my first question I want you to think about. How is it possible then that false teachings get created and spread throughout the church? How does it happen? Well, let me explain how it happens. The first way it happens is by taking scripture out of context. All right. And so they they take a scripture, it gets taken out of context, and then that thought an idea just gets like spread like wildfire. Let me give you an example of a scripture. And you may have heard me say this one before, I'm not sure. But have you ever heard someone say this? Speak those things that are not as though they are. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I've heard plenty of people say that. And they, you know, if you're praying for something, they might say, speak those things that are not as though they are. Well, guess what, folks? This is a scripture taking out, taken out of context. Here's why. When you look at the whole verse in Romans chapter 4, verse 17, and I'm going to read this in the New King James Version, here's what it says. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He's talking about Abraham there. In the presence of him who believed, God... Notice who he's talking about. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Okay? So notice who's, who has the ability to call things which do not exist as though they did. God does. And so sometimes the way false teachings and, and get spread or is we uh, because they take scripture out of context. It is so important when you're reading scripture, make sure you read it in context, because here's the truth. You can take almost any verse, take almost any little piece of a verse and make it and twist it, say almost anything you want. OK, so it's important that you do that. So that's one thing that one way it happens. Here's another way false teachings get created and spread is because they misinterpret the meaning of the verse. Here's what I mean by that. Let me give you another example, another verse that kind of gets uh, taken out of context. Third John, not too many people preach from third John, but third John chapter one, verse two. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou, I'm reading King James Version, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Um, this is one of the key verses in, you know, for people that are you know, believers in prosperity gospel, they use this verse. But here's a problem. They take the verse out of context because here's what the verse really means. And I'll read it from New Living Translation to kind of give you some breath to this verse. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. You see, it's a whole different meaning and they misinterpret the meaning. And that's why it's important not just to look at the context, but to look at the meaning of the words. Um, go back to the Greek if you have to. Get an interlinear and look at those things. But by misinterpreting the meaning, by taking scripture out of context, these are how false teachings get created and how they spread. The third way 
is that we, who are the hearers of these teachings, we don't test them to see if they are true. Notice what happens here. Uh, first, Second Timothy, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 15 says this. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So what does that mean? We have a responsibility for testing what is preached or what is taught. We looked last week at 1 Thessalonians 5.21, says, test them all. Another translation says, test everything and hold on to what is good. So we as Christians, you listening as a believer, have the responsibility to test what is preached or test what is taught. In fact, I would even say this. You have the right to test everything that I tell you. Tell you. If we teach anything here in the Bible Study Club, I give you full 100% permission to test it. And if you think it's wrong or if it is wrong, then feel free to reach out to us and let us know. We're not above error. We're not infallible. I'm not trying to say anything like that. So, so test it. If it's wrong, then let's correct it. Let's get it right. Uh, that's what's most important. Now, just to give you an idea of where this comes from, in Revelations 2, um, Jesus was spoke to three churches in Revelation. One church, he commended them for testing. This is Revelation 2, 2. This is the church in Ephesus. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. So the church in Ephesus in Revelations 2, in Revelation 2, Jesus is um, commending them for testing. But notice there were two other churches in that chapter, the church at Pergamum. He rebuked them for holding on to false teachings. He says, nevertheless, this is Revelation 2, 14, 15, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. I'm not going to get into that today and what they are, but we'll do that another time. But Jesus was rebuking them or chastising them because they refused to let go of bad teaching. The same thing in, in Thyatira, versus Revelations 2.20. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Notice what he says. He says, you tolerate false teaching. Okay, so we as believers, we as Christians, have a responsibility to test what we hear, to make sure it lines up with the word of God. In other words, you can't just go and bury your head in the sand and think everything's going to be okay. No, no, no. Test the word. If it's wrong, if it's not right, then you have a responsibility to deal with that. Okay? So I want you to, to, to make sure you, you address that and understand that. All right. Now, with that, Let's now start looking at some characteristics of false teachers. We want to begin to identify how we can identify false teachers and false teachings. And so where we're going to spend our time, if you have your Bibles, 2 Peter chapter 2. This is where we're going to spend uh, the rest of our time here this evening. And I want you, I'm reading from New Living Translation. So let's start with verse 1. And it says, but there are also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Just so you know, as I go through this, I'm, I'm going to be pulling out characteristics of false teachers because there's a lot in this chapter. There's a whole lot in this chapter. So let's pull those out. Here's the first thing that Paul, I'm sorry, that Peter says is that you need to understand the false teachers are among you. 
in other words, they look like you, they sound like you, they may even use the same language you use. They are among you. But remember what Jesus said, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. So outwardly, they look like a sheep. Inwardly, they're ferocious wolves looking to not help the sheep, but to devour the sheep. And remember, and, and remember what Jesus said, by their fruit, you will recognize them, by their character. Peter begins to highlight some of their character, and this is what we're going to look at. Notice what else they do. They introduce destructive heresies. A heresy, in case you're not sure what that is, is simply a false teaching. But notice that heresies are not only just false teachings, but they are destructive. And usually the teachings are destructive because they often are very loose interpretations of Scripture, and they often take Scripture out of context, which is what we talked about just a moment ago. Another characteristic and something to pay attention to is that many times they will even challenge or diminish the deity of Christ and increase their own uh, deity or elevate themselves. So you have to be careful about these types of things, right? So, so these are some of the things to look out for. First of all, the key things that they will be among you. And I think this is why sometimes it's hard to identify um, these false teachers, but they may look and sound and talk like you, but they're bringing in, notice, destructive heresies. Look at verse number two. It says many, and, and this is the, the sad part, many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. Remember what he said. He is talking to the people, he's talking to believers, and he says, there will be among you, many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality, and because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. One of the things you'll notice a lot of times about these teachers is that they have a very charismatic way about them. Now, not necessarily flamboyant or or anything like that. That's not necessarily always charisma, charismatic, but they have a way, excuse me, to get people to follow after them, a way to, to, to bring, draw people to themselves, a way to get people to follow after their teaching. This is what um, uh, these false teachers do. But what you also will recognize is many times they don't live lives that match even what they're teaching. This goes back to the character issue. So they're one way on, on in, in public, but they have a different life in private. Okay, that doesn't line up with some of the things that they profess or teach. But here's the other thing, and we've seen this before. Um, it says they bring slander and shame to the true gospel and the truth of God's word. They even call people, they cause people to mock Christianity. One of the things that, that has happened recently that uh, in our country where we've seen this happen is a lot of times um, with, our, with our election, because so many people were prophesying in the name of the Lord and declaring the outcome of it. And when that didn't happen, all of a sudden now, who looks bad? Not necessarily them, but it's God that looks bad. And all of a sudden, these people start um, questioning who God is, and the truth of the way of truth gets slandered. We've also seen, unfortunately, people who have um, done fake miracles in, in the name of the Lord or fake healings in the name of the Lord. I mean, there's so much of this stuff that's out there and they do this and what ends up happening is the way of truth gets slandered and they, they end up hindering the true gospel and the true word of God. So you have to be careful. All right. Notice 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. It says, in their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money but God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be 
delayed. So here, here's another truth a lot of times about false teachers and false teachings. Um, a lot of times they are greedy. They are lovers of money, not all the time, but a lot of times lovers of money and wealth and possessions. And they create, think about, they create ways to get your money. It's unbelievable, but it happens. And you may have seen some of these things. Um, I was watching, uh, let me give you uh, two examples. I was watching a uh, Christian television show. This is this is a few years ago. Um, I've since kind of stopped watching it, not for this reason, but maybe for others. But anyway, they were, someone was preaching and they were preaching from, let's just say they were preaching from Psalm 130, right? Psalms 130 verse one or something or and what they said was at the end of their preaching they said that if you there's a there's a, a psalm 130 blessing that if you send in 130 dollars there's a blessing that's attached to it right so they'll they'll create these ways of getting people to part with their money or if they're preaching from Jeremiah 29, they'll say there's a Jeremiah 29, 11 blessing. So we, if you send in $29 and 11 cents, then, then God's going to pour out a special blessing upon you. Uh, these are just simple ways of getting people to part with their money. Or they'll say, you know what? We need 10 people to do this, right? I need God show me that there are 10 people who are going to give $1,000. And they'll use language, not, you know, we would love if 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 we could have 10 people to who could support us with a thousand dollars towards the ministry. They don't say it like that. They'll say, God showed me that there are 10 people who are going or supposed to give a thousand dollars. Why do they say that? Because once you add God in front of it, that creates a level of conviction or you know, people start thinking, man, this is the man of God or the woman of God. And they said, God showed me, am I one of those people? You see, so they use these clever little schemes, these clever little tricks to part people, believers. We're not talking about unbelievers here, believers from their money. And so you have to be careful when you see people, when it's always about money, I, I, you, you just have to be very, very careful. Um, a well-known pastor that I, I, from a well-known church, they have a, a, a choir, and they went to this, this show to, to tape a recording. And they thought it was one thing, and what it turned out to be was just simply uh, a drive to get people to give money. And he was highly upset because he didn't want any part of that, but he didn't understand that until after the fact. Okay, so so be very careful because these false teachers, there is a underlying um, greed or ways. The Bible says it here. They will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. So be very careful there. Now, I want to back up for a moment because I want to talk about part of the challenge with identifying um, false teachers, teachings, prophets, and why you need discernment and sometimes why you need spiritual discernment. And, and here's why. They often will mix just enough truth with a lie, which leads to the deception. So they don't just come right out and say something that's just 100% a lie. They'll say something that has an inkling of truth in it, but there's a lie attached to it. Like we said before, this is why you need discernment because it's between right and almost right. And here's the here's the reality, folks. Any amount of lie, no matter how small, mixed in with the truth, makes it a lie. Almost right is not right, okay? Think about it. If you were going for surgery, right, would you want the doctor to be right or almost right, <laughs> all right? I don't know about you. I don't want the doctor that's going to be almost right. I want the doctor that's going to be right. It, re it reminds me of the, there was this uh, funny AT&T commercial. Um, 
and the, the guy is going in for surgery and they're like, uh, hey, have you ever worked with Dr. Francis before? And he said, yeah, he's OK. And the doctor walks in. Well, guess who got reinstated? And, you know, and he asks the, uh, the patient, are you nervous? Yeah, me too. So, you know, but don't worry, we'll figure it out. Um, you see, just OK, that's the slogan for at and Just OK is not OK. Guess what? Almost right is not right. So you have to be careful. But this this is how it's sometimes it's hard to discern these things and why I mentioned earlier that you need that spiritual gift of discernment as well. It's like math. When you have a negative and a positive, when you multiply those together, you come up with a negative. When you mix um, anything that's right with a little bit of lie, it automatically becomes a lie. The second reason is because they master the art of manipulation, but they disguise it as motivation. What do I mean by that? Manipulation is when you control someone or something to your own advantage. Often it's unfair and dishonest. So they want you to do something, and so they twist and manipulate to get you to move in the direction that they want you to go. And they may do that by using quote unquote, gifts of the spirit or words of knowledge or things like I said earlier, God said, and they're doing that to manipulate, but they disguise it as motivation. You see what motivation is, is, is to influence your behavior in a way that is usually positive and in a way that's going to be beneficial to you. Manipulation is when you um, influence behavior that is not beneficial to them but it's beneficial to the one who is doing the manipulation. And these false teachers and false prophets are masters at doing this stuff. They disguise manipulation as motivation. Okay, so, so I want you to be mindful of these things. And, and again, if, if you, you can see the deceptive nature of this, and guess what? These lies and deceptiveness, where did this come from? Obviously, this comes direct from Satan, because he is what? The father of all lies and deceit and all those things. Let's go back to 2 Peter. Look at verse 2, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 10. These people are proud and arrogant. Notice those two words. Daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. So two words, proud and and arrogant. And a lot of times they often have a misguided view of the supernatural and spiritual warfare. You know, like they'll make comments about, um, I'm going to beat up the devil and, and, and silly stuff like that, which, which I understand what they mean, but it doesn't necessarily, um, it, it, it kind of misguides really the supernatural. But the thing I want you to focus on is those two words, proud and arrogant. This is one of the key characteristics of a false teacher or false prophet. Proud, arrogant. Remember Jesus said what? By their fruit, you will know them. Well, one of those fruits are pride and arrogance. Be very, very careful of the proud and arrogant teacher, the proud and arrogant preacher, the proud and arrogant apostle, the proud and arrogant prophet. I don't care what title they put on it. When there is pride and arrogance there, you are on shaky ground. Here's why. Because when pride steps in, God steps back. Let me say this again. When pride steps in, God steps back. And when there is pride and arrogance present, then God is not in the midst of that. And I don't care how good they sound, how anointed they think they are, when there is pride and arrogance present, then God is not present in that place. I'm telling you this. You cannot, listen to me, you cannot flow in the spirit of God and the spirit of pride at the same time. It is not possible. Those two things are diametrically opposed to each other. When pride shows up, God steps back, okay? 
The Bible simply says this. It says, God, what? Resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What that, what that word actually means is God sets himself up against the proud and arrogant. In other words, when he sees pride, he is now against you. That's why it is not possible for pride and arrogance to exist. In, for, I'm sorry, for pride to move in the, in the spirit of pride and move in the spirit of, of God at the same time. It cannot happen. Will not happen. So when you see pride and arrogance flowing out of, quote unquote, the man or woman of God, the apostle, the teacher, the prophet, whoever, you can be certain that God is not at work when that happens. The Bible also says in Proverbs that God detests haughty eyes, those prideful eyes that sets themselves up higher than everyone else or above everyone else. When that happens, God is not present. And I think that's one of the real distinguishing marks of a false teacher, this pride and this arrogance that they are either better than or greater than or higher than or no more than and all that kind of stuff. And when that exists, God can't work and dwell in that place. Remember, when pride steps in, God steps back. Keep going. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. It says, these false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and like animals, they will be destroyed. Their destruction is is their reward for their harm for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. There's no shame, right? The old expression, shame in the game, there is none. They are a disgrace and a stain among you. They delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. Remember, they are with you. What you will also see a lot of times is that they often may have uncontrolled passions. And a lot of times the motivation for uh, a false teacher, or false prophet is either greed, power, or um, some form of pleasure. And we'll look at that in just a moment. So these people often have uncontrolled passions. There's no remorse or shame for any of their sinful ways. A lot of times they cloak their sinful activity in spiritual language to kind of cover for it. And they take pleasure in deceiving others. There was this biography I watched um, uh, about this gentleman. I forgot. His name escapes me at the moment. And he was literally a false prophet. He was. This was back in the early 70s. And he would go around to, um, to tent meetings and he would mimic everything that he was, that, that people saw him, that he saw people doing. And it was all about a scheme to make money um, or to see what woman he could get. These types of, I forgot the guy's name, but I watched it. It was just heartbreaking uh, to see what he was doing. Um, but they, again, this is the sign, these, these little signs, these uncontrolled passions, there's, there's no remorse. There's no shame. They take pleasure in deception and deceiving others. But most importantly, look, they are amongst the fellowship of the body of Christ. He says, they delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. Sheep, I'm sorry, wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay. Verse 14, it says, they commit adultery with their eyes and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin and they are well trained in greed. They live under God's curse. Um, what we see here, they have a lust for sin and pleasure that is never fulfilled. In fact, that, that is one of the underlying um, motivations behind what they're doing. There is this sad, there's this lust for, like I said, either power or pleasure or greed. It says they lure unstable people into sin and they are well-trained in greed. In other words, they prey on people who are weaker in the faith. So the person that's that's young in the faith or doesn't know a lot or is vulnerable, they prey 
on these on these people. They prey on people who are in unstable or in desperate situations, situations that they would do anything to get out of. Maybe they have a, a sick child or they're facing a financial difficulty or they're having problems at home or whatever it is, they they prey on these people and take advantage of these people. And so again, you have to be very, very careful. And like I said, the shame of it all is that they are among you. Go to verse 15. It says, they have wandered off the right road and followed the footsteps of Balaam, son of Baor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. If you go and, and read the story of Balaam in Numbers 22, um, one of the kings, I believe it was, it was either Baor or Balak, I can't remember at the moment, but he sent for a prophetic word. And with the prophetic word, he sent money. So what Balaam would often do was would exchange pr for prophetic words for financial gain. Um, and there are plenty of people that will do that out there. You, uh, We talked about, I think we talked about last week, where they may have the $50 line or the $100 line or the $500 line. And when you give money, you get a prophetic word. In fact, I had a friend of mine who needed prayer and he called one of these people for prayer. And before they would pray for him, they asked for his credit card. And he said, I just need you to pray for me. I know, but we need your credit card first. These are examples. And these are people that claim to be prophets. And so when you see these things, be wary, be careful, run if you must. Um, I think we might finish this tonight. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, it says, these people are as useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty foolish boasting, with an appeal to twisted sexual desires they lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. So two things, three things here. First of all, their message of a false prophet or false teacher is useless, useless. And their the message that they have has no real lasting eternal value. Typically, it's always usually about the here and the now. Um, and there's no lasting eternal value to their message. They are often self-centered and they like to speak about things that they have done. And again, notice the key, they lure people back into their old sinful lifestyle. And many times with sexual perversions attached to it. Notice verse 2 Peter 2.19, it says, they promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption for you are a slave to whatever controls you. The, the last note about these false teachers is often they promise victory or freedom or whatever it is, but in reality, they are bringing you more and more bondage. And a lot of times, reason why is because they're not trying to get you to Christ, who is the one who can help you. They're trying to get you attached to themselves. And that is just another form of bondage. And so you have to be very, very careful. Here's what God says about these. Their destruction is coming. They are living under a curse. They are condemned and they are doomed to the blackest darkness. So I need you to just be aware of that. So I want to end with this question, with all of these characteristics. And I hope I've given you a lot to look for. Um, and... And, and by the way, here's what I would say. I think this is important. Don't just assume someone is a, is a false prophet or a false teacher. Listen to what they say and test what they say. And then if it doesn't line up, then go back. And, and, and by the way, if you know them, then approach them and, and say, hey, you preached this or taught this, but something's not adding up here and see their response. That response will, will, will give you a lot of information. Because if they respond with arrogance and like, who do you think you are, then, then maybe something is off, okay? So how do you guard against these? How do you guard against false teachings, false teachers? I'm going to give you four things you need to do. And this is how we'll wrap up tonight. The first thing is you need to study the word so you know what it says. All right? So it's important. This is why you have to study your Bibles. You have to know what the Bible says. 
The reason why a lot of people fall victim to false teaching is because they don't know what God's word says. You have an obligation and a responsibility to know God's word for yourself. Take the time to do that. It's important. So that's number one. You study the word so you know what it says. Here's number two. You need to test the teaching and the preaching to see if it lines up with what the word of God says. Now, how will you know if it lines up if you don't do number one? Study. Okay. So you study God's word. So this way you can decipher and know, does it line up with God's word? So study the word, test the teaching and the preaching. Here's the third thing you need to do. Watch the fruit. Okay. Jesus said by their fruit, you will recognize them. This is their character. Watch the character. The character will tell you everything that you need to know. If there's pride and arrogance and all these types of things, watch the character. Because remember, where, where pride steps in, God steps back. That's how it works. And then here's the fourth thing. Pray that God would give you, would help you to discern between what is right and what is almost right. And that's really the whole key of what discernment is. So study, test, watch, and pray. And I promise you, if you do those things consistently, you're, you're constantly studying your word, you're testing what is said, you're seeing if it lines up in scripture, you are watching the fruit and the character of people that are, are teachers and preachers and, and prophets and apostles and bishops, I don't care what title they have, and then you are praying um, that God would help you, I promise you that will help you guard and protect yourself against falling victim to false teachers and false teachings. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. I thank you for every single person who has listened. I ask God that you would give us all the, 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 the desire to study your word and the discernment to know what is right versus what is almost right, Lord. I pray that we would become students of your word, that we become seekers of your presence, that we become filled with your spirit, that we would test what is taught, and that we would walk close to you so that you can help us to know, again, what's right and almost right. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we move forward, I just want to do this now. I want to... Um, always like to give you the opportunity. Maybe you've been listening to this and you've been um, wondering, is Jesus right or almost right? Well, here's the truth. Jesus is the right way. The Bible says that he is the way, well, he said the way, the truth, the life, and you can't get to the Father except you come through him. There's no other way. So if you're looking to get to the Father, then, I, then the only way to come is through Christ. And if you're listening and you've never received Christ as your Savior, but you want to, I'm going to ask you to pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you today to come into my heart, to forgive my sins, to wash me clean, and to make me your very own. I believe and trust that you died and rose for me, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed a very simple prayer like that, then we need to know, and we would love to know. So send us an email to hello at the thebiblestudyclub.com. And when you do that, somewhere in the email, either in the, in the subject or in the body, just simply say, I prayed the prayer. And the reason why is we simply want to reach out to you and we want to get you started and moving in the right direction in your new journey. So please reach out to us because we would love to, to hear from you. All right. So now we want to turn to comments and questions and I will ask the Control room, do we have any? We do. All right. Turn to control room. I have to give me a little inner earpiece so control room can talk to me. That's what I need to do. All right. So here's a question. This is coming from Wilson. Is a false prophet the same as a hypocrite? Uh, the point I am making is there are preachers who you can't fault what they are preaching, but their behavior is inconsistent with what they preach on Sunday. Very good question, Wilson. So I would say this. I would say that a false prophet. Um, 
okay, I think what you're looking at, right. I, w- I, would, I would put them in two different categories. Um, yes, a false prophet is a hypocrite because chances are they're, they're teaching something that either don't believe or they're intentionally trying to lead you astray. So they're pre- presenting themselves as something that they're not. But I would also say that the preacher who stands in the pulpit and preaches one thing but lives a life outside of that that is not consistent with what they preach, that person is also a hypocrite too. And just so you know, that Greek, the word in the Greek is hypocritos, which simply means an actor. So when you see a hypocrite, they're basically acting, they're playing a role. And so um, so I would say, yes, Wilson, that that's uh, probably a fair assessment to make. Uh, let's see. Um, Eugene asked a question. I'd like to learn more about fake healing. Does it take really take place or they just pretend to heal? Um, here's what I would say. And, and one of the things that, that I've seen and, and by the way, here's, let me, let me clarify this, this statement. God still heals people. God still does miracles. God still heals sickness and disease and and all of that. He does it hands down. Um, uh, so so there's no doubt or 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 issue with that. What happens a lot of times though is that, and what you'll see, because I've I've seen this, is that if you look at the the miracles that happen in Scripture, whenever people got healed in the Bible they were always miracles that were verifiable. So think about it. Blind men see, that's, you can verify that. People that were lepers were healed of leprosy. You can verify that. People were dead and buried and in the grave and they rose. You can verify that, right? Um, Deaf ears were opened or, um, you know, all of these things. So there was something that was verifiable about the miracles and the healings that happen in scripture. A lot of times what will happen now is their healings, but there's no verification of the healing. Now that doesn't mean God can't heal because he absolutely can and he does. But a lot of times what you don't see is the healings that can be verifiable like instantly. What do I mean by that? Where do you see the blind man whose eyes are becoming open again? or the person who walks in and you know is deaf and all of a sudden they can hear, um, or a person who can't speak, but now they can talk, or the person with, um, like Jesus, the man had a withered hand. Jesus said, stretch out the hand, and the hand was made whole. And so what happens is a lot of times you don't see those types of, of healings that can be verifiable. So um, unfortunately, not all of these, but unfortunately, some of these quote unquote healers have, um, and, and I hate to even say this, but they've positioned or they they have people that that they plant in the crowd to manipulate the people into thinking that they're healing, that they're healed. And again, this does not mean that God doesn't heal because he does. And this does not mean that God doesn't give people legitimate healing ministries because he does. Unfortunately, the the people that are fake cause people to slander the, the true. And so that happens there. So hopefully that answers your question, Eugene. If not, please uh, get back to me. Um, let me know. There's another question here. Is there a time when the Holy Spirit won't be felt? Um Holy Spirit used to speak to me daily, now sometimes, and when I pray for an answer, nothing. All right. Um, I would always say this, and um, if you want the Holy Spirit to speak, and, and, I, and I will say this till I'm blue in the face, until I can't ever say it anymore, um, always remember this, and I, and I think I said this a few weeks ago, before you concern yourself with what God is saying Make sure you are spending time engrossing or spending time with what God has already said. What do I mean by that? So often we want the Spirit of God to speak to us, but we deny or neglect 
what the Spirit of God has already said. There are 66 books, Old and New Testament, of what God has said, and, and, and we need to engross ourselves there. When you do that, you become familiar with his voice, and then you can then he can begin to speak to you. As we said before earlier, the most consistent way God will speak to you is through his word. So if you are not spending time in his word, then I promise you, you will not be able to hear what God is saying. You must spend time in his word. That is the most consistent way God will speak. That is why he gave us his word so that we can depend and trust in his word. And that's what you need to hold on to. So if you don't feel like you're hearing God speak to you, open your Bible and start reading. God has a whole lot to say. He's already said it. Open your word and begin to reading. Begin reading. And as you do that, God will begin to speak to your heart. He'll begin to show you truth and, and revelation and things like that. So that's what I would encourage you to do there. All right. Uh, any more questions, hon? Huh? No. Any comments I need to read? Wow, I just found out we have Sarah joining us from New Zealand. Oh, my goodness. Um, I don't know. It must be tomorrow in New Zealand. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea what time it is in New Zealand. Um, fantastic. Well, thank you, Sarah, for joining. I'm not sure if this is your first time or not, but thank you for, for being a part. Don't forget our Canadian friends. Yes, and we have plenty of friends joining us from Canada and um, all over. So I... I you know, um, in this Christmas season, because next week is uh, Christmas, um, you know, we just want to thank you folks for for for, for hanging in with us because, um, you know, my wife and I, and I and I can say this on her behalf, we so absolutely look forward to being with you guys every week, and we um, we're so thankful that you are faithful in, in joining us and um, and supporting what we're doing here. So, so on behalf of my wife and the whole Bible study club team. And, and I can say God has blessed us to build a team. Um, we just want to say thank you for, for, for being with us and, and joining with us and, and hanging in there with us. So it's, it's 3 PM Friday. all right. So it's 3 PM Friday in New Zealand. So that's what time is. So that's what a day and a half ahead of us, basically. So, um, so tell me what's going to happen tomorrow since you're already there. <laughs> <laughs> Since you're in the future, tell me what's going to happen in the future. So, um, <laughs> and it's Maria's first time visiting, too. amen. So, there's a Maria, this is her first time with us. Thank you, uh, for joining us here, Maria. Um, and anyone else who's uh with us for the first time, all right. Um, let's see, am I missing anything? All right, control room says we're good. So uh, just a few things as a reminder. Um, if you are being blessed by this, then please make sure you like and share and um, make sure you like the video and share and subscribe to our channel and um, like and follow our Facebook page. That'll just keep you up to date with what is going on in the Bible Study Club. Uh, also, <clears throat> we do have our podcast, the Bible Study Club podcast. So just go to your favorite a podcast provider, and you will be able to find it there. If you do have a prayer request, uh, we do have a prayer team. So please send those in. Just email that to hello at the Bible study club.com, and we will agree with you in prayer. And if you do send in a request, I do have one simple ask is that if you do send in a prayer request and we pray, just, just keep us posted and up to date of how things work out. So this way, uh, when God works on your behalf, we can rejoice with you, which is what we want to do. Um, also, we have our website, ClarenceHaines.com, where you can go there and, and uh, see what's going on in our ministry. And I write for Crosswalk.com and BibleStudyTools.com, so you can find uh, lots of articles that I've written there, and hopefully those will be a blessing to you. Uh, next week, we will be back next week, which um, uh, was the week of Christmas. Next week is the week of Christmas, and it is Christmas Eve, but guess what? We have something really nice planned for you next week, so so uh, so tune in. We'll be, um, we'll be sharing something, a uh, word that God allowed me to preach before, so we'll, we'll be glad to share that with you 
Um, I want to thank you all for, for being a part and joining us. And God willing, we will see you next time in the Bible Study Club. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.